Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate Occasional Lecture. My name's Jackie Morris, and I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure with the Department of the Senate. In welcome, welcoming you here today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, and their elders past and present. Ariadne Vroman is Professor of Political Sociology at the University of Sydney. Much of her research has focused on digital technology and how its use has transformed the way citizens, particularly young people, engage with politics. Her most recent book, Digital Citizenship and Political Engagement, explores the radical effects social media and digital politics have had on the way advocacy organisations mobilise and organise citizens. Over a comparatively short period, digital media has profoundly altered democratic processes. To discuss how this has affected citizen engagement and given rise to new types of political campaigning and organisation, please join me in welcoming Professor Roman. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you for coming. I feel like doing that thing that I often do with undergraduate students. We're in a big space. You can come a bit closer down if you'd like to. And I promise this will not be a stand-up comedy gig. I won't be ridiculing the audience at all. So you can come closer down. All right. So in general, citizens feel ignored by politics. They feel left out. And I've been interested over the last 10 years or so to try and figure out whether or not digital engagement is providing new opportunities to bring citizens back into political processes, back into democracy, and particularly whether or not the digital context can create political equality. So it's not just the wealthiest, the most privileged voices that are prioritised within political processes, and whether or not there can be broader representation of a diverse range of voices. So today I'm really going to sort of skim over 10 years of my um, research and my thinking in this kind of area, give you some overviews of some different projects and some empirical data that have um, covered four of my main projects. And I kind of, this quote is from one of my main projects, The Civic Network, which was studying how young people use social media for political engagement in Australia, the US and the UK. And um, I will give a quick shout out to my wonderful research assistant, Michael Vaughan, who made my little emoji um, tags. And that basically means that, that this young person was engaged in politics with their hand up, they're Australian, and they don't come from a privileged background, which is what the other emoji there means. Uh, but you can see in what he's saying here that there's, there, young people have good ideas. They have ideas about wanting to be engaged and how they can be included, but there is this feeling that they're not, they're not cutting through. So with this idea that I'm interested in thinking about does digital engagement really provide us with opportunity in a time of disaffection, in a time where trust of politicians, trust of political parties is probably the lowest it's ever been, is there sort of promise and uh, potential for renewal? So part of that is thinking about how are citizens using digital media to engage in politics? How are the processes that they're using underpinned by quite a significant shift in the way they think about politics, away from a sense of sort of duty to what we call engaged citizenship norms, where personalised politics, processes of storytelling are quite core to the way politics plays out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm then going to talk about how new advocacy organisations have emerged in this context and how they use digital tools to engage and mobilise citizens. But then towards the end of the talk, I am going to talk about the dark side of social media and an increasing focus on uh, privacy, surveillance, uh, unfair speech online and how citizens think and feel about these processes as well. But I kind of start from this point that social media is more or less ubiquitous in the lives of most people. Uh, if I just look at young people alone, around 90% have a Facebook account. But we're also seeing the increasing use of Facebook and other social media platforms by older generations as well, as it kind of becomes mainstreamed, mainstreamed in their everyday lives. So it is a space of politics for people to think about. 
But this idea about how we think about there are competing normative agendas about what we actually expect of citizens and how we expect them to be engaged and involved in politics, what it means to be an active citizen today. And these are the kind of imagined versions of what it means to be political um, that we have and why participation of citizens even matters beyond the voting that they might do every three or four years. And for a long time, understanding this, the dominant idea of citizenship has been this idea of dutiful citizenship, where elections and governments are always at the core of democratic participation. People use traditional media to follow news and to be informed. They trust leaders and they join formal political organisations. This is often characterised as a politics of loyalties. But in, over the last 10, 15 years, maybe even longer, we've seen a kind of emergence of engaged citizenship, where allegiance and trust in government has weakened. There's often a focus on lifestyle issues or issue-based politics that mobilise and engage people. There's this mistrust of political actors. People don't join formal organisations as much. They might join loose networks that um, around social and political action, and they use communicative means and digital media to find out about politics and engage with one another. And this we could characterise as a politics of choice. Uh, and But what is often in this kind of binary between dutiful citizens and engaged citizenship, it's not sort of a neat division. People might have different um, approaches to politics on different issues or different stages of their lives even. And we often don't, when we're looking at young people in particular, we often don't focus on the differences among young people and how rising inequality in terms of economic, cultural and even sort of symbolic political capital really matter to our understandings of these differences between dutiful and engaged citizens. Is it still the most privileged citizens that are able to engage in this ad hoc way over the issues that matter to them and have their voices heard? Are still big questions that we need to understand when we create this expectation of what we want for citizens engaging politically. So one of my main projects has been this project called The Civic Network that I worked on from 2012 to 2015 with my colleagues Mike Zenos and Brian Loder. It focused on young people aged 16 to 30 in Australia, the US and the UK. And we were interested in looking at how inter the internet was transforming the kinds of ways that they were engaged in politics in the three countries, but also whether or not social media was emerging as a space of political action itself. So we asked about these kind of range of different actions that people can do um, that are political, from contacting government, wearing a symbol, persuading others how to vote, signing a petition, making a donation and so on. And just, I guess, one of the main things to take away from this is that, uh, you know, it ranges from the differences between Australia, the US and the UK aren't very apparent, the kind of the patterns are kind of similar with the US young people sort of slightly more politically active than the other two countries. But it does range from the sort of very few people who engage in kind of demonstration or protest based politics and then we have the actions down the bottom where most people have signed a petition and talk about politics with their friends and family. Uh, yeah. But we were interested in and we found that 81% of young people had engaged in at least one of these acts in the previous year. And it was about an average of, um, of four different kinds of things that people had done. So young people were relatively engaged on this kind of um, straightforward measure. We then asked well, what percentage of these actions that they're involved in was performed online. And what we found here is that for the vast majority of these acts, digital is the first port of call for young people. If they're going to engage in politics, then it's usually through a digital mechanism that is bringing them, bringing them in. Um, and some of these actions are less visible once they're happening and the mobilisation is happening predominantly online. Uh, and But thinking about that most of them are digital, particularly the bottom one, signing petition, writing to media, even contacting government, are overwhelmingly uh, more likely to happen online than offline. Uh, it tells you about the kind of digital mechanisms that are available to young people, but also moves us well and beyond this idea that young people are all apathetic uh, and beyond the sort of clicktivism versus offline activism hierarchical binary that a lot of people are still attached to. So online is kind of ubiquitous. It is the kind of portal into participation. But there's a really important exception here, which is why the top one is highlighted. When we we've saw in the previous slide that 
young people were most likely to have, in, to have discussed politics with other people, with their friends and family, but it's the least to happen, likely to happen online. And that was kind of an interesting quandary for us that I'll refer back to later on about why that might be the case. So in the next stage of this project, we focused on Facebook in particular as the space that young people were most likely, uh, well, the social media platform that young people were most likely to be using. We looked at a range of different ways that young people could use Facebook for communicative politics, sharing and following links, learning about major news and political events. And again, we can see that young people in general are learning about politics through social media. For a lot of young people, with, particularly with the last line, two, uh, nearly two thirds of young people hear about major news events on social media before they hear, the, hear about them in other forms of, of media. But what this also points out to us is that there's a select group of young people who are promoting news media politics into the news feeds of other people. So only around a third of young people are sharing political or social issue material um, to, within their networks online. And so it's these, these young people, this third of young people, who are kind of the social curators, who provide the political glue within social networks, often sort of shaping the way people um, learn about and hear about politics itself. Uh, Again, this has been sort of a long-term project and if we ran this again today, the results might be slightly different as we're sort of focusing more and more on Facebook as a contested space. Uh, we've seen in the last few elections a lot of debates about um, fake and particularly hyper-partisan or polarised sharing of news and information. And Facebook itself has changed in its algorithm and the way it distributes information and the way we as users access it to prioritise again, what our friends and family are posting and to deprioritise a lot of the other public pages or news and media pages that we might follow. So it is not a static process, the way that we engage with social media for politics. It changes over time. Uh, Okay, and I would also say that if you want to see more about that, look at the, um, the Reuters Digital News Project. It has a lot of data on that, and I've got some colleagues from the University of Canberra who run the Australian arm of that project too. We also asked about how young people use Facebook for more proactive forms of political engagement, trying to uh, mobilise others to vote, to get involved in political and social issues. Uh, and, and we found here that the number of young people doing these kinds of things declines. The proportion of young people who are sort of much more proactive in their political engagement on Facebook is, is, uh, is smaller, relatively up to around a quarter of young people. While we looked at these nine acts together, we found that only 6% of young people who use Facebook had never engaged in any of these different nine acts. If we just look at these uh, four acts, we found that only 27% had never done any of these. So Facebook is a political space for sort of the everyday use for young people. When we were modelling this in our regression analyses, we found that traditional indicators of privilege, such as socioeconomic status, were not the main predictor of whether or not young people use Facebook for engagement. The, instead, we found that it was whether or not they were already interested in politics, their political socialisation experiences, and also whether or not they had these engaged citizenship norms that were more important for understanding why people would use social media. So, Going back to that previous point about discussing politics online and a lot of young people being reluctant to discuss politics online, in our qualitative work, we spent more time asking young people about this to, to dig into it more. And what we found... Sorry. ..is that two-thirds of our hundred young people that were involved in our qualitative online discussion work. So two thirds of young people were negative about politics because they saw it was largely about conflict. And so they were reluctant to engage with others about political issues and about politics more broadly because they were fearful of disagreeing with other people or arguing within their family and friendship networks. They were also fearful of other people telling them that they were wrong or that they didn't have um, their facts right. 
when young people were more positive about using social media as a space for politics, they tended to be more comfortable with those communicative acts of liking and sharing, but not the more sort of proactive forms of debate and discussion. They also saw it was a useful way to like pages to receive information about what was going on. And we've got, I've got a quote from one of the young people who was politically engaged um, about why there was this reluctance to, to use spaces like Facebook to engage in politics. She said, I'm fairly willing to put my views out there, but generally I don't go out of my way to. When people were changing their profile pictures to the equal sign for marriage equality, that was something I was willing to do, maybe with a quote or something. After Obama won his second term, I definitely had some cheery tweets about it, but nothing that could really piss anyone off. I try to express my views more in real life than online because I don't think people are able to handle those conversations maturely and people end up getting in fights that have nothing to do with politics and a lot more to do with name calling. So there was kind of an illustrative quote about this sort of probably, yeah, I see a few nods as well, about people's sort of reluctance to put their views out there on social media, which have a lot to do with how people think about politics itself. But whilst this might sound like a a kind of a negative picture, we did differentiate between young people within our qualitative groups. So we had four different kinds of groups of young people that participated in our groups. And again, I go back to my emojis. So we had young people who were engaged in politics and came from privileged backgrounds, young people who were engaged in politics and did not come from privileged backgrounds, young people who were not engaged in politics and came from privileged backgrounds, and young people who were not engaged in politics and did not come from privileged backgrounds. So four different groups. And so we found it distinct patterns across Australia and the US and the UK in our qualitative work where Rich young people didn't really see that they needed Facebook as a space for them. And young people who were not engaged in politics were definitely reluctant to sort of voice their views online. And there was a lot more discussion amongst those groups who weren't engaged in politics about their concern about being told that they were wrong, they didn't have enough information, they didn't really understand. But what sort of provided us hope for the potential of this counter stratificational effect of social media spaces was the group on the right, that those um, young people who are already engaged in politics but don't come from privileged backgrounds, probably don't have the sort of political capital where offline they have spaces where they can talk about politics with others every day and engage with them. These young people across the three countries were really positive about social media in general as providing them with a space where they could meet with like-minded others. And that for us was kind of quite distinct and interesting. Uh, that there was this kind of positive idea and there was this possibility of creating more kinds of connections. Okay, so that's that project in kind of a nutshell. But my other long-term research interest has been on new kinds of organisations that have emerged in the digital context or what I would refer to as born digital um, advocacy organisations. And this is kind of the other side of the individual engagement I've been talking about so far. And the kind of challenge to advocacy and political organisations in Australia and a lot of other similar advanced democracies about how organisations can bring people into sort of politics and advocacy and the issues that matter to them. And here I'm very influenced by a colleague, uh, Dave Karp, who wrote a great book called The Move On Effect, where he makes co a deliberate contrast between three generations of advocacy organisation. And you can kind of see the sort of three columns of the three generations. The, the first generation of advocacy organisations is a more traditional kind of organisation. We might think of unions or business associations might fit in here, sort of uh, organisations where typical activities or I could probably say political parties are probably first generation organisations sort of mobilising around shared identity, there are meetings, people pay membership dues uh, and the organisations are kind of you know, a federated structures. Second generation issue based organisations are a lot of the organisations that emerged in the late 60s, 70s and early 80s uh, around issues such as the environment, human rights and so on, where people were encouraged to sort of write letters, uh, mail in, uh, involve in sort of mail based campaign. The funding source tended to happen through direct mail or people would be signed up as subscribers. You think of, um, you know, 
chuggers, uh, people who are often around and about trying to sign people up to join, join environment groups, join human rights groups and so on to get them on their subscriber and um, uh, list and sort of are paying in that way. They tend to be focused on single issues. There's been a lot of debate about how they've sort of professionalised and a lot of their advocacy work focuses on lobbying. And then CARP focuses on the emergence of these third generation of organi advocacy organisation that's based on activity and actions, where there might be meetups, people vote online, there's a the possibility for people to sort of submit their own content rather than follow the direction of the organisation themselves. The funding source tends to happen through micro donations. So people might, might make a sort of small donation that might be, you know, help us get this ad onto television. If you donate $5 today, we can, you know, put up the ad on TV, we can put up a billboard uh, and so on. So the sort of, rather than having a long-term fee-paying fee membership, there is this, uh, this shift in focus on smaller micro donations related to particular events. These organisations are often seen as issue generalists, that they focus on, they chop and change on different issues that might be relevant of the day rather than single issues. And these are the born digital organisations that are internet mediated. So Dave Karp mainly focused on Move On in the US. It's uh, about 15 years old, oh no, 20 years old now. Uh, whereas I've sort of, for the last 12 years, uh, been focusing on the emergence of GetUp in particular and how it has challenged other advocacy organisations. So my book, Digital Citizenship and Political Engagement, charts this process of how GetUp has um, had success and had failures, but also how it's kind of had a different model of what advocacy looks like. So it was founded, GetUp was founded in 2005 as a sort of, uh, it was founded as a progressive multi-issue born digital advocacy organisation. Part of its story from when it was first founded was that there needed to be progressive advocacy in light of um, the coalition government at the time that had control of both the House of Representatives and, and the Senate. And so that in 2005, and I at different times have um, gone in and studied them. They have three main sort of broad issue areas that they focus on around social justice, and economic fairness and environmental sustainability. Ori originally they were mainly focused on the national government, but now their, their campaigns also target corporations as well as state governments too. At this point, they have one million members. What these members are, they're not members in the traditional sense of the first and second generation organisation. The vast majority of them don't pay regular fees, uh, membership fees. They tend to make, if they make donations at all, they are ad hoc small micro donations. Uh, in their most recent annual report, they had 10 million revenue, which compared to a lot of the traditional advocacy, it's a lot of money, but compared to a lot of the traditional advocacy organisations in Australia, a lot of the big names, it's about a third or a half to a third of the kind of revenue and budget that those organisations have. And 25% uh, of their revenue comes from 1% of the members who are members who pay a regular monthly kind of fee. So which means that 75% is coming from those micro donations that they fundraise around particular events, um, campaigns, issues, and so on. Uh, since the 2010 election, GetUp have been the leading interest group in terms of um, declarable political expenditure. So when we look regularly at the Australian Electoral Commission results get up is you know up there declaring the money that it's spending for politics. While collectively unions and business affiliated organisations still dominate uh, political expenditure in Australia, get up is definitely up there as kind of a, a citizen oriented organisation. So part of clearly the argument I'm making is that get up fall in as sort of a typical example of this third generation of advocacy organisation. They have a different structure. They have a different way of raising money. They have uh, 
members can sort of opt in and opt out on particular actions that might matter to them, from signing petitions to sending letters to attending meetings to becoming part of an event. So it's very this activity-oriented form of participation. And GetUp talk a lot about their mission to involve people more in politics and more actively in a critique of sort of the passivity of some of the other organisations that mainly ask people to make donations so that professional staff can undertake the advocacy, lobbying and, um, and political work. Increasingly, GetUp uses digital media. So they were a born digital organisation, but they were born with email being their main way of contacting people, creating a membership list and mobilising people to politics. In the last few years, they've focused a lot more on social media and how they can use social media to mobilise people into politics. And particularly from this chart, which um, I looked at, particularly in my book from 2011 to 2015, and I've added in 2018 to show that it's still a growing uh, focus for them is building up their social media followers to the point where they now have nearly 500,000 followers on Facebook and 140,000 on Twitter. But Facebook really matters now as people don't read all their emails as often and it takes a lot more for people to even respond, let alone open an email, let alone to actually follow through and respond to an ask. All of these kinds of born digital organisations need to look at other kind of spaces. And so Facebook is a space where they've been focusing on a lot more. It matters for distributing information about campaigns. It matters about organising to bring people together and... Uh, and to go to meetups and so on. But what it's underpinned by is visual and shareable content. So really, Facebook is all about the posts that are most shareable. Because it's, and this is kind of the logic of social media itself, is the how, how you create shareable content. And part of this is the Facebook algorithm in that even though a lot of people will be following GetUp, they might not see GetUp posts in their feed. They're more likely to see GetUp posts in their feed when it's shared by someone in their immediate network, by their friends or family. So that puts the pressure on creating content that is, uh, is topical, is urgent, is often sensational, uh, is often visual, often includes videos or memes and statements and so on. So this kind of changes the way that politics is represented as well. All right, so I need to move on. But these born digital third generation organisations that Dave Karp talks about and that I've talked about in the Australian context, it's not just about using social media. It's not just about digital in the way that they've challenged other organisations. So they are usually quite flat organisations. They don't spend a lot of money on staff. They have a lot less staff than the more traditional bureaucratic organisations that often spend a large amount of their money on fundraising. So, it, you know, they spend money to make money. Uh, this is sort of less of a feature. There's this focus on active membership that I've talked about uh, and the talk about on and the shift to sort of fundraising. So the areas in orange are the areas where we can see that a lot of different advocacy organisations of Australia have responded to this challenge. A lot of organisations are now focusing much more on how they bring their membership into active forms of participation, either online or offline. Uh, and a lot of them are using social media much more effectively. They're not using Facebook or Twitter just as broadcast ways of sort of pushing out information. They're trying to encourage these processes of interaction, get discussion going, but importantly, to try and um, encourage processes of, of sharing as well. So we see a lot of different advocacy organisations are doing that. But the areas that I've kind of left in black are the areas where those sort of first and second generation advocacy organisations haven't changed much at all. They're kind of reliant on their existing, um, their existing structures and their way of raising revenue in particular. A lot of them are constrained by their charity status, for example, or, um, or, or their DGR status, or they're constrained by needing to charge fees for service and so on. They're not really rapid response organisations. If they want to make an immediate response to a topical issue, uh, that's going on in the world, it often takes many layers of bureaucratic sign-off before they can even send out a Facebook post or make a statement and so on. They're not nimble organisations, a lot of the existing kinds of organisations. But we are seeing, and one of the things I'm very interested in is 
the values agenda that underpins a lot of these new organisations. They focus a lot on creating new narratives of doing politics and they focus on storytelling. This is kind of the personalisation of politics, how people and their stories and their experiences become the centre of campaign work and that's built on from there. And part of their mobilisation processes are uh, trying to engage with empathy, with the use of, um, of storytelling in particular, as rather than making arguments that are purely based on facts, research and information. So there is this contrast between traditional ways of doing research and lobbying and advocacy and this focus on narratives and storytelling. And arguably, this is a growing area that's happening amongst a lot of advocacy organisations in Australia. They focus much more on their narratives and their building of, um, of, of stories and sharing storylines. And a lot of them go through similar training to learn how to do storytelling. The, um, the organisation Australian Progress runs regular conferences, the Progress Conferences, where people talk about how they create their narrative and storytelling techniques, or they can pay a lot of money to consultants to go on courses and so on. And here's an example of this sort of personalised focus around storytelling from um, a Get Up campaigner. We see that you know, a story is more engaging when talking to a stra stranger than any amount of statistics. We see this time after time. You know, we have to take action. Taking action alone is nowhere near as powerful as taking action together. And the way to make personal connections and telling a story is an amazing way of doing that. So part of my argument overall is the digital context is really important, but it's this shift to sort of values and storytelling that's actually really important to understand that the digital context has enabled this, this quick sort of spread and sharing of stories, the social media logic. Um, Storytelling as a sort of prominent advocacy technique really uh, started significantly um, in the US in the 2008 pre uh, Obama presidential campaign. His team kind of developed a lot of these techniques. They then came to Australia, trained a lot of people in Australia, get up sort of ran camps. Now political parties in Australia are using these techniques as well around how to use storytelling. And even if we look more, and it's not just, storytelling isn't just used by progressive organisations in Australia. A whole range of organisations now adopt storytelling. And even if we just look at the marriage equality campaign last year, we can see uh, both churches and conservative groups, as well as sort of the more usual suspects, using this sort of narrative driven, values driven, focus on stories rather than focus on facts and statistics and research. Okay, and that's led me to my most recent project, which is, well, one of my more recent projects, which is on the emergence of change.org in Australia. So change.org is an online petitioning platform where citizens can start their own petition campaigns themselves. So rather than signing on to a campaign that an advocacy organisation runs, they can um, choose the issue that matters to them and, uh, and sort of build up, build up the campaign and story from there. The founder of Change.org internationally, Ben Rattray, suggests that the more personal and the more emotive the issue of a petition, the more powerful the response from the public is. So we can kind of see that Change.org has been enabled by this shift in the sort of digital and storytelling context. Change.org is incredibly popular in Australia. In our study, we have, we're have we studying 17,000 petitions and we have over 3.5 million people who've signed on to a petition. Three quarters of those people only ever sign on to one petition campaign. Although most of these petitions are not successful. They don't actually create change in the target. Uh, but arguably what they're doing is they're creating a space for citizens to start something that matters to them. They might draw more attention to that particular issue, even if it's not successful. They might build up a sort of a critical mass of people who are interested in that issue and increase awareness and so on. And we can kind of see this interesting array of campaigns that Change.org uh, talk about as successful. They really, they have different kinds of targets. They're not all at national government. A lot of them are at corporations. Some of them are at state government. Some of them are at um, civic organisations. Some of them are even targeted at individuals. So it sort of has a range of potential targets. When we coded all of the 17,000 petitions, we found that 75% of the petitions had some sort of policy relevant or political content. So the other 25% were sort of consumer-based <coughs> petitions or petitions that were that were aimed at sort of individuals but weren't at, uh, about a policy issue 
at all. So we're interested in this project about thinking about the emergence of change.org, why has it sort of become quite popular at the moment, and whether or not it's bringing new issues to the broader public agenda that uh, maybe are quite different from what traditional politics is looking at. Uh, and one of our answers is the reason that change.org has become quite popular is because there aren't very many uh, government-based petition um, petition portals in Australia. Unlike places like the US, the UK, Germany, Scotland, uh, that have quite well-developed petition platforms where citizens can go onto government-sponsored sites and start their own petitions that have a sort of requisite number of signatures or so on about whether or not a response is necessary. Uh, the House of Representatives does, has a, does have a site now. It's relatively new. Um, only 256 petitions have been started on it so far, and there have only been 137,000 signatories. So that's quite different from the change.org database where we have uh, 3.3 million people signing on. So it's not well known and it's not being used broadly. And the states have kind of uh, quite minimalist petition sites as well. So there's this sort of opportunity structure for change.org to emerge. But one of the other things we're interested here I know this is going to be hard to read, but I'll make a simple point. Is there's no using, we coded all of the sort of policy areas. The blue lines are, tell us which, how many petitions there were in each of those areas. That shows us that health, law and crime, education and culture are kind of the three biggest areas that people are going to sign petitions on. Macroeconomics is one of the areas that people are least likely to start a petition on. We can also see that health is one of the areas that both has a lot of petitions and has a high number of average signatories as well. So health issues are often important to people to get onto the broader agenda. We can also see that agriculture, agriculture also includes a lot of um, broad agriculture and farming issues, but also a lot of animal rights issues too. So the blue is the number of petitions and the red is the average number of signatories in that area. Yeah, there's a bit more, I think in the paper, there's a little bit more, it's a little bit clearer. But um, yeah, so the main thing of it is the, the kind of range of um, areas and then Okay, so law and crime has attracted, particularly attracts well above average number of petitions and a, and a substantially higher than average number. So the averages are down the end in the yellow and, and the green. So health, health is kind of an interesting area. And one of those areas that I flagged at the beginning that change.org celebrates as a major victory was this particular campaign. So this campaign, which is called Don't Exploit People with Life-Threatening Illnesses, it was started by a 14-year-old boy who was regularly going into hospital for treatment and it was about car parking fees in hospitals, uh, particularly for um, the families of patients who were having long-term medical treatment. So in the end, it ends up being a major win. Uh, in hospital car parking, there's now $21 maximum week charges from what was previously $200 for a lot of people. So you can see that this was having a sort of a significant effect on um, people who were regularly using hospitals. This, this particular petition uh, became a success with 70,000 people signing on. So it's not one of the biggest petitions in our data set. Some of the biggest petitions in our data set have you know, up to a million or several hundred thousand sign-ons. But it's also interesting in that it has a clear win. The Minister for Health in New South Wales and several other state ministers sort of sign off and change their policy. But also what was interesting about what part of what made this campaign successful was the buy-in from particular media sources. Um, News Corp media in particular became very active in this campaign, if not at some point saying it was their campaign rather than the... Um, than Gideon, the 14-year-old boy who's, who started the campaign. So it was an interesting process of how campaigns on change.org, petition campaigns, sort of uh, capture the imagination. They start from this very personalised story and then how they sort of gain further um, attention and empathy and have the potential to create policy change. All right, but the last thing I'm going to do from our change.org work is um, this chart. 
So this chart is just making the basic contrast between the topics that happen in our petition data set versus the um, topics that are on the legislative agenda in at the national level. And the main point is, is sort of at the, the right hand side, uh, disproportionately compared to legislation, health, transport, civil rights, community development issues, the environment and so on are the kinds of areas that petitions are being started on, um, but not as likely to be discussed in Parliament. At the other end in particular, macroeconomics. So we're talking about sort of taxation, uh, revenue raising for government and so on, uh, broader economic infrastructure, much less likely to be the subject of petitions, but much more likely to be on the government agenda. So it's kind of interesting that there is quite a sort of a, a contrast here and what this might mean for sort of citizen engagement and understanding of political processes, but also whether or not they think that government is responsive to the issues that matter to them. All right, so I've got five minutes left, I think. Yeah. So in my last five minutes, I'm just going to move on from, I guess, what's been kind of my positive story about how digital enables citizen engagement and gives them new spaces to put their issues onto the agenda. There are possibilities for uh, a broader range of sort of young people's voices and so on to other research that I've been doing, my other current project, which focuses on digital rights and particularly how increasingly digital platforms are a concern for Australians. In this project, we did a nationally representative survey, which found that a majority of Australians are actually concerned about the violations of their privacy. They're worried about how other people, governments, corporations, and social media platforms are violating their privacy, collecting data on them, tracking them through the processes and their and um, what they're doing through the internet. So in this project, we're kind of thinking about well, what's you know the dark side of social media that has become ubiquitous in people's everyday lives. And in the project, we're focused on a range of issues around uh, privacy and surveillance, and, uh, but also about speech. So going back to that original point about the kinds of things that might be constraining a range of people feeling like they can engage with others and talk about politics and talk about the things that matter to them is also about how people are concerned about arguments and conflict. So we asked people in this survey whether or not they thought everyone should be free to say and do what they want online. What we found that in quite contrast to American research, so often there's this sort of North American ideal of absolute freedom of speech online. Australians aren't really strongly wedded to this kind of ideal. So only around a third of people agreed that they should be free to say and do what they want online. 30% disagreed with this and a third sort of expressed reservations and sort of sat in the middle. So we can see it's kind of quite an issue that really spreads people out about how they think about this. But we're also interested in the differences. So young people are much more likely than older people to agree that they should be free to say and do what they want online. Men are much more likely than women to agree. Um, there weren't really differences based on education level and the differences based on capital cities versus non-capital cities is quite minimal. We asked about a whole lot of specifics about whether or not people thought it was okay to criticise government policy online. A majority of people think that's okay. We should be able to criticise government policy. But only 31% think it's okay to criticise religious organisations or religious beliefs. Only 25% think it's okay to criticise minority groups online. Although consistently we found that men are much more likely than women to think that it's okay. And to an extent, older people are more likely to think that those criticisms online are okay. So while we found that most Australians hadn't experienced negative impacts themselves from risky or harmful speech, there were people who were concerned about sort of growing levels of abuse, um, mean remarks, or even their content being um, posted and shared with, with their consent. And more than our interest in privacy, um, there was a strong sense amongst the people we surveyed that Australians want a lot more regulation to be going on of online discussion environments in general. Right, so my last slide. So how might we think what all this means for the future of political engagement and particularly in uh, using digital mechanisms with citizens? So I've made a kind of a series of arguments and one of them is that not all citizens are the same. It's quite sort of straightforward. Citizens are diverse. They need diverse kind of strategies that are inclusive and bring them into uh, 
to feeling like politics matters in their lives and that they can they can have a say and make a difference. We need diverse strategies to, to think that through. Uh, using digital media tools as kind of an add-on to existing strategies is not a democratic panacea. So just bringing digital or social media ways in, helping people write better social media isn't going to sort of fix these broader concerns that people have about communicative spaces and have about digital media. Clearly politics is personalised now for a lot of people and all kinds of political actors need to think harder about how they can pander not to self-interest but focus meaningly on how they use that personalised politics to build shared senses of identities and ideas um, and I guess a positive story of us as a community more broadly. And part of that is how politics itself, capital P politics, might need to change. We have a sense that adversarial conflict and polarisation are a real turn-off for citizens, and we were seeing that um, throughout our research. So there are some sort of lessons to think about about there and how that sort of conflict avoidance work can take part. But also in terms of the citizen side, maybe we also need to think about how we as a community can learn to debate, to disagree, without this being reduced to, a, to uh, an us and them position rather than sort of a general sense of we as a community. And thank you. I'll finish there. So thank you very much, Ariadne. We've got about 10 minutes for some questions and you'll see their mics on the sides of the room if you would like to ask a question. Have we... God, I can't imagine that there aren't quite a few questions out there. Yes. Um, perhaps if you go to the mic, if you don't mind, just so people can hear. It is a difficult room acoustically to hear if we don't, aren't projected. One, two, one, two. <laughs> uh, thanks, that was really great. I really like the um, correlation of um, sociology and politics for the first example. I just want to um, focus on the fact you're really talking about political spaces that are explicitly political. Uh, you know Stephen Wright in Melbourne, he's got this whole theory about how politics is performed in spaces that aren't, yep. aren't yep. explicitly political, like discussion forums about, you know, daily life or hobbies and then people have arguments and disagreements and it's sort of, that's how they come to politics. I was just wondering, because you seem to be really focusing on politics, like people just talk about politics and that's what they do. So I'm wondering about the fact that, you know, people seem to be less involved in politics and maybe they're doing it in a different way. Mm. So I'm wondering what you think about that. Yeah, no, thank you. It's a good question. And um, Scott Wright's research has been, is really influential on my own, particularly his work on third spaces and everyday spaces is what you're talking about. And the work that we're doing on change.org, which a lot of these people wouldn't necessarily classify the petitions they're starting as capital P political but even that they are about issues of power and redistribution and needing some sort of response from um, you know, a political actor, be it a corporation or a government. So that was part of our process was to say that these things are political because they are meaningful to citizens and on the issues that, that matter to them. And I think that that's really true. Like Facebook more broadly could be that kind of third space because often fa politics is not the main reason people go on Facebook, unsurprisingly. It's really to sort of have that connection and communication with their family and friends who might be around the country, around the world. It might be to follow their kind of interests or passions. I follow a few too many dog um, Facebook page, <laughs> dog related Facebook pages at the moment. So, you know, politics is incidental and a lot of people have incidental exposure to political debate and issues. So I guess it's thinking about how do they feel that they have um, a space to have a say, to be heard and to make a difference within those third spaces. So it's really important, definitely. Mm -hmm. ah. Hi, Ariadne, also from UC, Caroline. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Caroline. Um, really interesting, and I was really interested about your data on the reluctance of young people mm. um, to participate in politics online. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but in our digital news report this year, we asked a question specifically about that, and we did find exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that particularly um, 30s and under were more reluctant than other age groups yep. uh, to express their political views online. Um, I was wondering whether or not... I mean, we also found that in Australia, we had a greater reluctance than in many other countries. I wondered, in comparison to the US and UK, whether you found that yeah. is one question. And the second question I have... Just given that there is this reluctance, and part of the strategy for these um, advocacy organisations is to get people involved and to discuss, have you found whether or not they're shifting to sort of closed group messaging apps like WhatsApp, et cetera, mm. um, 
to shift their strategy there to have the discussion. I'm just wondering because we're finding, you know, and certainly in countries where freedom of speech is limited, people are going to WhatsApp and those other closed spaces yep. because they feel safer. Just yep. No, I think that's that's a really good point. Um, I think there is clearly a shift to other platforms away from Facebook, even if it's to Facebook Messenger where people get to sort of decide who is a part of their group. And sometimes those groups can be really large, so either using Messenger or using WhatsApp, and people sort of see that as a known a known space where they can talk about issues that matter to them. That is definitely going on. It's definitely going on for young people. I don't have a lot of the research on it. Um, but I think the comparative angle is really interesting. Like we kind of found in general that the young Americans were sort of the most participatory, the Australians were in the middle and the young, the young Britons were at the least. And the young Britons in general, there have been bigger issues around, uh, around turnout from, um, you know, around even from Brexit and the, gen the recent elections, they're less likely to vote. So I think all of those issues are interrelated about whether or not people feel that they have voice, that they have, that they have representation and that they're actually the issues that matter to them are on the policy agenda. And I guess that's part of what we're quite interested in if there's, a, if there's that relationship there. And in other work, we've looked at the relationship between the issues that matter to people and they were quite different across the three countries as well. Mm -hmm. Any further bids for questions? Yes. <laughs> this is funny. This is all my academic colleagues asking yeah. questions. <laughs> you don't have to be they are an setting, academic to ask They're setting the bar please. very high. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Marion. I just wondered if you'd like to talk a little bit more about... No, you yeah. need to talk into the microphone. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Why was it taken out? OK, there we go. Yep. Um, yes, I was wondering if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the dark side, uh, yep. anti-social media as a crime against democracy, the use of online intimidation and threats to silence uh, politicians and so on. Mm. Yeah, okay. So the, the Digital Rights Project really kind of, I guess, grew from this kind of concern about, I mean, a few different things. I mean, first of all, all of these social media spaces weren't set up necessarily to encourage political, uh, political space and political engagement. Most of them are for-profit sites that, um, you know, monetise our data and um, sell, sell, I guess, our product to, to advertisers to, to target at us, to profile us to, um, in that kind of market relationship. And increasingly what we're interested in is how political organisations are using these techniques as well. And we've seen the controversy around the Trump election and also around Brexit recently about how organisations like Cambridge Analytica were using processes to create profiles of people and target often quite negative advertising at people, often to kind of depress their turnout or change um, or change their vote altogether. So this is kind of controversial. But all kinds of organisations are using these processes. So maybe we also need to think about the kind of both the positive sides of how targeted advertising and profiling are used to to, I guess, encourage the sharing and encourage the sort of spreading of different kinds of stories and, um, and agendas, as well as we see the dark side. But I think what the other thing that you're talking about in particular is about trolling, and uh, which most people on social media, most people on digital media aren't trolling. That's not the sort of the way that they approach the use of this digital media in their everyday lives. But increasingly it's becoming a problem. And I think you're right that political actors from all kinds of persuasions are targeted with a lot of negative feedback and a lot of trolling, which doesn't sort of create a space for interaction or meaningful sort of authentic engagement between um, citizens and and, their, well, and and political actors. And I guess that's why we found that people want more regulation in this space. They want particular accounts to be shut down. They want to be able to appeal to Facebook and have um, posts taken down that are either slanderous about them. So I think this is the point where the broader debate that we have to have about what is government's role in regulating here? What are our expectations of these platforms themselves about regulating speech? And the answers aren't simple or easy. So that's part of why my answer is let's think about the regulation, but it's also thinking about how do we get to a point where we're engaging in debate and disagreement that is um, constructive rather than detrimental and, um, you know, and mean and exclusive and shutting down um, all kind of discussion or difference at all. 
I think we've got time for one Just more, if there's a final bit. bid. Yes. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I work um, within the parliament and one of my roles is around how does the parliament do outreach, digital outreach yep. work. Um, okay. And um, one of the things that uh, in a conversation I had with a presiding officer from another parliament, um, they were talking about the way that uh, disruptive technologies have come and influenced other industries and they used, used examples like Uber or Airbnb and things. And um, the way that there's potential that if um, you know our democracy, but our parliament isn't um, able to adapt, that there's potential that there's that disruption like that can um, could play a role in sort of uh, influencing to the parliament's detriment um, how it operates. And um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on a whether you think that is a, a, a is a concern or is something that the, you know a, an institution like the parliament should consider. Um, uh, to what extent? Um, you know, new movements like change.org, get up, these types of things are just part of the new society that we work in and where that interface is with um, the institution, I suppose. Yeah, again, it's not an easy answer and I don't have all the, um, all the solutions. And I, part of thinking about, and I think that your focus on disruption is, is interesting. And I guess it's thinking about what is the mismatch between what uh, capital P politics cares about and the kinds of things that citizens are getting active and mobilising on. And how do you increase that conversation in an interactive and productive, productive way and responsive way. In our work that we did just focusing on young people, we asked them, you know, they were uncomfortable about discussing politics with their friends and family, but on the other side, they all wanted to see politicians and political actors on social media and interacting with them. They thought that was a really good thing. Uh, but they were also very clear about what they thought interaction meant and what authenticity meant. They'd sort of say, you know, we don't want an anonymous sort of staffer of the politician writing the post. We want to know it's them. We want a kind of more personal connection and we want to feel like we've been listened to. So I think that kind of how we shift to that process where people feel like they're heard and they're included, which the petitioning process kind of does a little bit of that at a, at a sort of broader aggregated level. And I guess it's how do our political institutions adapt to this, uh, this context where people expect those sort of horizontal connections and horizontal networks. They're less about the kind of traditional forms of hierarchy that mm -hmm. politics is built on, or even those first and second generation advocacy organisations are also built on that kind of hierarchy. So I would often say, relax a little bit more and give citizens a little bit more control and benefit of the doubt, um, particularly for things like thinking about um, petitioning platforms within parliaments and within institutions and it, particularly if people if they and if you want to have it at all then you need to promote it you need to make it easy and accessible you need to make the content really engaging and, and shareable as well so I, I don't think it's easy uh, solution but I think that there are different ways that it can be done and there are definitely Scottish Parliament's a really good example of, um, of a different way of doing a lot of that work Thank you very much. I think you'll all agree it's been a very thought-provoking talk um, and some great questions. I think you've given us a really positive um, outlook on the level of engagement of young people and thrown down a few challenges to traditional political institutions like the Parliament. I think you talked about um, uh, making debate and disagreement constructive and that's yeah. certainly the reason to have a Parliament. Yes. So you're certainly right on the, the topics that are of interest to, to us. So thank you, Ariadne. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thank you.